PC Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is our number two of the Jake Feinberg Show, coming to you live on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live, download our free app, and stream all of our live local programming, including yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. And we're delighted that you made us part of your day today. And without further ado, I want to bring in a cat that's right in the Jake Feinberg Show pocket, taking a traditional classical instrument and stretching it across all musical genres to create transcendent music. He's uh, in purgatory out in Eugene, Oregon, but that doesn't stop us from riffing today. Jerry Goodman, welcome to the Jake Feinberg I, Show. I, 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 did, I did say purgatory. You did. did. Uh, you did. <laughs> you did. It might have been a little extreme. I don't know. How you been, man? How you doing? I, I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you, Jake. Thanks for thanks for uh, allowing this to happen. This is great. Oh, man, it's a, it's an honor. You know, I, can I ask you, I, I was uh, looking at uh, uh, different, uh, I was going through some albums today, but I wanted to ask you specifically about some cats that were using the violin and stretching your ear when you were really young that were maybe, maybe they were playing classical music, but it was more avant-garde. Who were some of your inspirations growing up on the violin? Well, I, I wish I could say that I was inspired in a, in a soloist, soloistic direction by anybody, but, I, uh, but really not nobody on violin. That's for sure. If anybody, I would, you know, I, I would pick Jimi Hendrix out of anybody. That's, oh, that's, I, that's I, yeah. I, there weren't too many people for me to listen to. I mean, back then, you know, there was Jean Luc, who, who was, you know, certainly a wonderful player. But that's not exactly where I w- would be pulling any of my inspiration from in terms of soloing. Can you unpack the? It's funny. I had a younger cat on Will Blades earlier, and he was talking about Hendrix, you know, keeping a foot in the old, and then you know, bringing in his own sound. But can you talk about what inspired you? Uh, uh, about Jimmy? Well, uh, Jimmy, it seemed to me, was just so open. And, you know, it, it, it showed in his, in his writing and in his playing. And to me, I would listen to him and go, gee, I wish I could just let things happen the way that he did. And uh, I started playing guitar when I was pretty young. And um, even though I had been playing violin for a long time, I, I, uh, I felt that if I was going to connect to anything, as a soloist who was going to be on guitar. And uh, so I started listening to Hendrix more and more. And it just so happened that I, I was talked into using the violin in the band of Flock. I kind of fought it. <laughs> That's interesting. I, uh, you know, having been brought up on classical music, it was not something that I felt I was, I don't know, it felt wrong for me to do it almost. You know, to allow that instrument to be used that way. I was a pretty young guy, and uh, and I fought that whole thing, and I was talked into incorporating it into the sound of the flock by Rick Canoff, just a wonderful guy, and he was he was uh, the saxophone player in that band that uh, that asked me to be part of the band, and um, I started doing it and um, transferred over whatever I had been doing on guitar in terms of soloing. I just kind of moved it over onto the violin and hoped that it worked. And it did. It did. Did you, this is fascinating, I love this stuff, but uh, did you find yourself assuming composition responsibilities with the flock as well? I did. I did. And there were some wonderful writers in that band. And I, I just, uh, you know, for, we were a bunch of kids from the north side of Chicago who just felt as if we could do whatever we wanted in music. There was nothing holding us back. Well, I wanted and to, I wanted, I, yeah, that's what I what I wanted to get at was that you said it was almost, uh, I forget the word you used, but you felt conflicted about transferring uh, over to the violin because you had been brought up on classical music. But I wanted you to talk, there, it, we're living in a very, in my mind, a very classicalized time right now. Uh, you, you hear National Public Radio, they play a huge amount of classical music. There's not a lot of devotion to spiritual jazz, transcendent music. Um, and I look at that as conformity, the idea of taking your directives from a conductor. And I, and I would right. love you to talk about the liberation, if you could talk even about a specific time when you realized once you were composing with the violin in an avant-garde rock setting, how liberating it was that you were no longer taking the directive from a conductor. 
Well, I think I gave up on that directive long before <laughs> I, ever, I ever started playing in a rock Sure, band. most cats like you do, I get it. But, <laughs> but no, I mean, that, but, to, but for, for other people that are petrified of breaking away, talk about the well, liberation. Know, it, it, it's, it's an interesting thing about classical players. I find them to be pretty much the most open in terms of, of what they listen to and what they can hear. I, I, I just would have been, you know, all the people that knew what I did way back in, in the early days in Chicago, uh, about people that were in the Chicago Symphony and people in the Chicago Civic Orchestra and those guys that I kind of grew up with who just, I hear from them and they say, Tom, I love what you're doing. I love what that is. I love this. I love that. You don't hear that from a lot of jazz players. Mm. You hear it more from classical players. It's so it interesting. Seems, interesting. Just seem to be so ready to hear other things, and uh, you know, for me, it was really it was great because I it, it happened with my own parents, who were both classical players in Chicago, and uh, my mom was part of the Chicago Symphony for a long time, and they were so open to what I was doing. I mean, maybe not all of it. Maybe not standing on tables with my shirt off playing. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, uh, right. a lot of what I was doing, I mean, my father, uh, before he died, had come to several flock concerts and, and sat there and was proud. And, and that meant more to me than anything, the fact that he could open up his ears and watch what I did and listen to what I did and tell me he loved me. I mean, that was a huge thing for me. Well, we just got off the phone with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Cat Delbert and Glenn, uh, Glenn Clark, and he was just talking about his dad finally, it finally, you know, clicked in with him that when he started playing with Bonnie Raitt, uh, his dad was like, wow, you're playing with, with, with John Raitt's daughter, you know? And so it's, it me, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, I mean, but, but from a musical point of view, it, it must have been, it, it's, it's so, why do you think your father had such an open mind? Also, the other thing I want to say is this, that you said classical players are very open to hearing new sounds, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are comfortable playing new, new stuff. Well, it, no, and certainly, you know, when, when you grow up following the notes on the page and the conductor telling you how to play them, it's not easy to break away from that. And I actually stopped doing that pretty early. Right. So, I mean, for me, and, and also the fact that I, that I started playing guitar. I think, uh, you know, I think it, it allowed me to open up in that area a little bit, you know, so that by the time I was talked into picking up the violin and plugging it in, I had already had some experience of trying to improvise and trying to solo. So for me, it wasn't just jumping in with that instrument and, and making it do something different. I, I had already I, yeah. started. No, this is different. unbelievable because I don't think I realized that you were a North Sider. First of all, <laughs> you, you think that you think a Cub fan? You mean? Well, well, that, I mean, I was going to ask you. I, you know, what, you think they're going to get to the World Series? I, I, I think they might. This might be their hardest matchup. I well, think this is, you know, as, as Chicagoans, we always think they're going to get to the World Series. <laughs> but, uh, you know, hey, it's, you know, it's looking good. You know, you got to keep, got to keep it, you know, got to keep the history. Well, they got a, they got a great mind. manager, man. He's such a great, smart dude. Um, and, and, and they're talented Absolutely. as all get out. But I'm curious because I interviewed Barry Goldberg and he talked about the, the organist and, and he talked. I'm just curious if you, you know, to see the black, the authentic black blues players, you had to seek it out. And I'm just wondering, oh, yeah. if, did, can you talk about if that, the blues uh, is, is in everything, but it may not have been in your, your bag. But well, I'll, t yeah, go ahead. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you straight ahead. What, what, what really made a difference for me was joining up with those guys in the flock. Because they, before I joined the band, they were a cover band. And I mean, I, for me, listening to the tunes that they were playing was, was just an education that I could never have gotten anywhere else. I started out as a roadie for that band. Wow. So I was going all over the place with them and setting up gear and then listening to shows. And they turned me on to Sam and Dave and they, you know, all kinds of people that I would never have listened to. And then, you know, the Chicago blues scene was, was thriving back then. And so, yeah, I, I was, I was lucky to have had those guys, and been able to travel with them and learn from them. Did you take Did you take your apparatus into 
a, a south side club and play in that blues setting like just just with you know just just i never did <laughs> never did unfortunately but right. no it, it was uh it was more a matter of my my sitting there and, and listening and learning and and educating myself it was really no i probably you know I, I i regret the fact that i never did that i missed out on playing with some great players um i'm just also so the flock ultimately how who discovered at the time was it john hammond that discovered you guys how did you wind up getting a, no, a record no, contract and, uh, no no we we uh <laughs> we got a record contract through a guy named aaron russo who owned a club in chicago called the electric theater and that that place turned into well he changed the name it became the kinetic playground <laughs> and uh the flock used to use that place to basically get a gig whenever we wanted it and to rehearse in. It was a big club with a really nice stage and, and we would play there and had our had been developing our own audience and we had a manager who wasn't really able to do anything for us in Chicago. And that's when Aaron Russo decided that he he was wanted to take over and whatever Aaron wanted, Aaron got in those days. He was uh quite <laughs> He's not around anymore, so I, I won't say what I would like to say about Aaron, but, you know, you take a seven-piece band from Chicago and you decide that the record contract should read half for Aaron and half for everybody else, that's so it's a little intense. Yep. But uh, yep. Aaron got us a record deal within three weeks. He got us signed to Columbia Records. This was something that he had guaranteed. And he flew people in to listen to us, and they liked what they were hearing. So... He did it. He made it happen. And then and uh, it was also, if it wasn't for him, we probably still would have been together for a long time, you know, but uh, we couldn't survive. Um, I want to read you a quote. Uh, this is uh, jumping ahead a little bit, but I, I wanted to, to uh, this is from a, from an interview I did with Billy Cobham. He, and he said, we were very tired. The Mahavishnu orchestra was playing at the Olympia in Paris and we were very tired. We had been on the road maybe eight or ten weeks between the United States and Europe. No real time off from each other. Uh, we were just hitting it because the iron was very hot and we had to strike. We finally got to the last date before the two-week break. The next thing you know, I'm tired and we're playing and it's about a two and a half hours into the show. Normally we play about three, three and a half hours. It's one song after the next, one song after the next. I might only play a little on a ballad like Lotus. We were so synchronized. This is what happens when you, you're so tuned in with the music, with the individuals playing it. Much of what was happening becomes automatic. Your subconscious clicks into a point where it's running the body on automatic. It's like running a plane on automatic. And all of a sudden, the brain goes into a second mode, and you can literally go away from it. And like a ghost, you can watch everybody. I remember being on the... Wow, Billy. Billy. <laughs> Billy. This is deep. <laughs> Very poetic. <laughs> I remember being, this comes from the radio interview. I remember being on the bandstand and watching myself partially fall asleep on the snare drum as we're playing because I was tired. I saw everything happening around me and I also realized we needed to start closing this down because we needed to catch a flight. And he goes on and on and on. But I want to talk to you about playing music, improvisational music, burning, burning music for three and a half hours. And if you had experiences when you left your, looking back on it, or even at the time when you left your physical body? Well, you mean without drugs? Exactly. Absolutely. Well, and Billy never did drugs in his life. That's right. That's what I did. That's why I do this show because they want to, you know, exactly. With or without drugs. No. But I, but listen. Uh, well, yeah, go ahead. I, I would have to say that there were times when I, when I definitely was in a, in a zone where I, I would almost wake up and realize that I was performing live. It was, and it, and it had nothing to do with drugs, really. Talk about the zone. I, I want people to hear about it, the zone. It, it was a place that I think improvisational music is like that. It can be like that. It's when you're listening to other people and you listen and you draw from what they're doing to, to, to do what you do, and then you become part of what they're doing. And in that way, I'm, I would almost sit, you know, and a lot of the solos were very extended in that band as well, you know, and, and John would be going on and on and on. And I'd be sitting, I'd be 
you know, loving it and listening to it from the side of the stage. And, and yes, I would have to kick myself to get back up there and play my soul. Right. But you did, you did well, man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> forgot that I was in the middle of it. <laughs> I was you know, enjoying it, you know, and, uh, and, and from listening to what Billy said, I, I have to say, you know, he had his hands full because, you know, a drummer, my God, he put out so much energy during the night. I didn't have it that bad. You know, I could sit there and listen to other people solo forever, you know, and then I'd come up and do mine. Well, my solos were not that long. They, you know, they were, uh, they could have been, they could have been longer, but they were what they were. And, um, so I, I wasn't burned in the same way physically as those guys might have been or Billy at, at any rate. And, uh, you know, for me, it was an, it was emotionally draining, if anything, because, I was just scrambling to keep up. I was I was an infant in those days musically, in terms of improvisation and uh, jazz improvisation. It was all new to me. Playing an odd meter was brand new to me. Wow. So I was learning. I was in school. Let's talk about. And, uh, so let's just uh, did because the first time I interviewed Billy, he he was on a session, uh, maybe a Quincy Jones session, and John was like, "Hey, why don't you come down and." Uh, I don't know. He said something about baggies. There's a luncheon. Baggies, bag, yeah, you baggies. Know, baggies, and uh, but then that was a rehearsal studio, yeah. Right, and 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 and, and then I, I think Charlie Hayden was the original bassist. Uh, but I, I can you talk about how Goodman found his way into the because Billy said when they first started playing that when you guys first started playing it was like, I mean you'd come in. Uh, in the morning, maybe, and then have a sandwich or whatever, and then and then walk out, and the the sun's already down for the day. You know, it's like you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, that doesn't really. We live in this time now, unless you're living in a place like Eugene or a communal area where Ashland or there are places like, but it's more fractured. But that was New York City, right around 1970. I mean, how did you join that? And then, how did you, as an infant? I mean, those you there's so there's a bevy of YouTube clips of you just on stage. You don't look like you're 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 fighting it. I mean, so how how did how did that all come together? Because that, that I learned how to make it look like I was in maybe you, was yeah, you, really faked, it. you faked it really good. <laughs> I don't think, well, yeah, that, that that was part of what I did well. <laughs> but no, but how did so how did you? Because I I just assume that. From from the flock, then you had to move to New York because of Columbia, but and that's how you connected with John. But if you could talk about the inset, how you joined the band, I would love that. I actually okay, I can tell you that I I didn't move until uh, move to New York until I met John. I mean, until until we talked about putting the band together, uh, the flock broke up, and I moved to Wisconsin. I was living on a farm in the dead of winter, like six feet of snow on the ground. Wow. And I uh, got a call in the afternoon from a guy with a heavy British accent who told me he wanted me to play on an album. And, and uh, it took me a while to realize who I was talking to because I couldn't quite understand him. But when I, when I realized it was John, of course I knew who it was. And I, I, of course I had been listening to Tony Williams' Lifetime and Miles. And, I, you know, I was pretty blown away by the fact that he got a hold of me. I and, cannot and, believe that he called you on a landline in the middle of winter in Wisconsin. And he, <laughs> it was pretty, it's pretty, it sounds pretty amazing now. I love it. But that's all we had were landlines. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah, I just love it. I, just, I know, I know John well enough to know that he obviously had been listening. Did he, did he say, say that he saw you live or he heard the album? Or? No, he had heard the flock album. Beautiful. Continue, please. And, and he was looking for a violin player to play on his album, My Goals Beyond. It was a, a Douglas Records. Oh, my God, it. a burning. The, I mean, oh, God, it's my favorite. Wonderful album. It's my and favorite. I, he flew me to New York, and we met for the first time. I had never met Billy. I didn't really meet too many of the other people that played on the album. I... Uh, I I, we didn't all play at one time, so it was kind of interesting. But, I mean, I think I met Charlie Hayden at that time. Um, and I did what I had to do, and John said he was thinking of putting a band together, and would I be interested? And I said, well, yeah. You know, I mean, I have to play. You know, when the flock broke up, I wasn't looking for anything. I was looking to relax and sit somewhere isolated, and I was doing that. 
And, uh, you know, so when I played on this album and I realized that there were players like that, I, I just couldn't believe it. And then he said, well, I want, I, w I want to go out and listen to this drummer that I'm thinking of using. You know, would you come with me? And of course I went with him and we went and heard the band Dreams. And Billy Cobham was a drummer. And I heard Billy for the first time standing there with John McLaughlin. And I... <laughs> I think I needed help getting out. The I door can. This is mind blowing. I, this is un. So <laughs> this is. Wait. So hold on. So Billy had already laid down rhythm tracks on my goals beyond, and and then yes. You, so you and then you came in and played your parts, and then John was like, "Well, you know, I'm thinking about putting this band together. Come see Dreams." And then you got to see Billy live. Exactly. Exactly. Unbelievable. Can you talk? Because I'm. This is so fast. To me, this is perfect because, uh, were you? I mean, the. I know at the time John was ch really was obviously channeling his spiritual mentor Sri Chimnoy because he was trying to, in his own way, uh, transcend without hard drugs. And I'm just curious about your meditate. You wanted to just hang out at a farm in Wisconsin. <laughs> were you were you tapping into Eastern spirituality at the time as well? I to me it's just like you can't. I was not. Okay, you were not, but I mean, but I mean, this is like, did you talk about that? You went to the where were the Douglas Studios, by the way, when you? Uh, well, you know what? I, I honestly, I don't remember where we recorded that. I'm sure someone could tell you easily. I can't remember. So well, that right, so so, but you knew that you you had a hard time getting up after that, and then well, ha having listened to Billy for the first time, I, I just didn't know that that there was anybody who could play like that. I mean, it really blew me away. And I, of course, told John that I would say, yeah, of course I'd be interested in doing it. <laughs> I, you know, I don't care who else he decided to use. I'm going to do it. You right, know? right, right. And, and I actually picked up my family and moved to New York. I mean, I, I just, we moved to, uh, to uh, Queens, and John was living in what was at that time the... East Coast ashram of Sri Chinmoy. And I moved into something that I just wasn't quite ready for. And I have to say, John didn't push it, you know. And in fact, I lived around the corner from him, and I was like right down the street from the Smile of the Beyond ice cream parlor. And, uh, you know, John himself had a business in Queens. He had, a, he had an Indian restaurant. He did? And, this uh, is unbelievable. My, <laughs> my wife at the time worked there. And John and I would go and play there every now and then and, you know, sit on the floor and play acoustically, just jam. This and then, this is why I do, this is why I do my show. This is exact, <laughs> the, the idea of having uh, some, uh, you know, some beautiful spicy curry while Goodman and McLaughlin are playing. <laughs> and, 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 and the food was great. And the education was even better. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about because you're making this out like you're, you're being beyond humble because... You never played raga music. You never played odd meter music. You you no. barely did. How, how? And, I, and I never studied it, and I never really listened to it until mm -hmm. I joined that band. So so for me, it really was a, you know came out of nowhere. I just said what, what seven eight? Wait, oh wait a minute. Uh, okay, <laughs> I think I can do that. It can take me a while, you know. But I never said that. It just took me. A while. <laughs> it took me a while to feel comfortable with it but but you know like anything else the more you do it and and of course I, I you know i had to do it i didn't have a choice and you know i was it was a trial by fire really can you talk about we, we got together and yeah. rehearsed for a couple of weeks and, and went and recorded an album and started playing immediately i mean it, it was not a, a long drawn out thought out thing you know it happened very quickly and the touring, you know, just to, just to throw this in there, we didn't tour in those days the way tours are put together now. We didn't have we didn't even have a tour manager when we started going out, and we would tour, and the tour never ended really. I don't know what Billy's talking about about getting two weeks off, but we they kept adding gigs at the end of the, the existing tour, so we would we knew we were going out for three weeks. But those three weeks kept extending. You know, oh, there's another week. There's another week. So yes, we were burned out totally by the time we actually broke up. Uh, this is I'm talking to Jerry Goodman here, live on Power Talk. Um, 
Could you talk about McLa- McLaughlin as a, a leader? I, you know, one of the L's on my program is leadership. And um, I just feel like it's a vapid quality in our society now in all levels. And uh, there were ways that Miles and that, you know, Jack Teagarden and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, uh, I, I'm, the names are escaping me, but, you know, I've talked to enough accompanists to know that these cats had a lot of nonverbal, very effective nonverbal ways of communicating on the bandstand. And I just, even when, in, in, it, when you were learning this, you talk about, you know, picking this stuff up, you, it was trial by fire. Can you talk about uh, what you think is good leadership and then, what McLaughlin did as a leader uh, uh, that that inspired you or that helped you become co- feel comfortable expressing yourself in these areas that you necessarily didn't ever listen to and never had any interest yeah. in that kind of stuff. Yeah, to to me, I think John's strongest suit as a leader was his ability to put people together. He found players that could communicate musically, and I, I you know, this is this has has to have something to do with his ears. I could never have done that in those days. I mean, I think I'm better at it now than I ever was. But for him to be able to choose players from different countries even, and, and knowingly put them in a room together and say, this is really going to work out well, I mean, wow. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's I never really thought about that. That's... That was brilliant, and, and he's still doing it. I mean, his fan now, the fourth dimension is similar in that way. I mean, Gary Husband, just a phenomenal player, and, you know, drums and keyboards, you know. Yeah, monster player. But John finds these finds guys and puts them together, and, and they shine. They really do. But what are the, yeah, yeah, what are the intrinsic, though? I mean, is it is it the big, I mean, did he just inherently trust, he knew that you had big ears and you could fit in, that you had feel, or that ultimately finding players that, in some ways, I mean, he was doing it with Shree, but, I mean, you had to put your ego at the at, at, at on the side. I mean, you, you it was it was oh totally. Well, I did. I mean, I, I <laughs> like I said, you know, for me, I mean, I was I, after gigs, I would have liked to have been able to hide in a closet somewhere, <laughs> having listened to what I just did and knowing what I just did. I you know, it took me a long time to really feel like I was contributing. But I you know, at the same time, I would look over. At, at John's face while I was playing certain things and get such a positive response from him. I think a leader has to do that, has to let it, let it be known when you're doing something really well and, and that he knows it. So that was really, for me, kept me doing it, kept me smiling while I was doing it. Um, how did you... You didn't want to listen for a while. I can understand that. Um, was there a point when you started really? I mean, you because I mean, let's be clear about here about Jerry Goodman is that Mahavishnu might have uh, you know gone its separate way, but then you started to collaborate with the guy who I interviewed. I don't know when I started my show. One of the most brilliant cats from the uh, from Prague, which was uh, Jan Hammer, and you guys started to do your own collaborations and peel off of that. So. I mean, well, Jan and I had been working on that during the touring, you know, every sound check, every hotel room, you know, there were things where we would get together and mess around and knowing that at some point we were going to put it all down. And, uh, Jan to this day, one, you know, just one of my favorite musicians of all time. Yeah. We let in with, with, uh, with uh, I, I heard a little bit of it. With yeah, like yeah. children, can you? I mean, that seemed to me like a situation where you might have, because there was that whole enclave up in the the Woodstock region. Were you guys up? There? Where were you? Where did that album get made? Because you know, Jan was doing. You guys were all playing multi, multi instruments, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and a lot of it was done on a four track machine, and <laughs> and that Jan had in his studio that he was just beginning to build up that in those days up in upstate New York. And uh, I went there to record with him, and then we finished it at Trident Studios in London until that place fell apart, and then we moved. It seemed like we had technical difficulties that followed us everywhere. We had a problem with the echo return at Trident Studios that they they realized they couldn't fix it until they tore down a wall. Wow. (laughs) It was like it was built inside the wall of the studio. 
and they had to tear it down in order to get to it. So we moved to, to uh, Caribou Ranch in Colorado, and the, you know that was owned by the uh, by Jimmy Garcia, the guy who managed Chicago. Sure. And uh, you know it's just a wonderful setting, a beautiful place, and a studio built on a mountain of iron ore, <laughs> so that. If you didn't stand within a two-inch parameter, you're going to hear buzzing and humming, and boy, we had trouble. And we managed to finish the record in Chicago. And uh, so, yeah, we moved around to get it done. But White Children was, was uh, you know, there was, there was an album where Jan and I decided, well, we could, we could do what we do. He played drums, I played guitar, along with our main instruments, and it was fun. Were you a were you a Curly Cook fan, that drum, that guitar player out of Chicago? I meant to ask you that. I really wasn't. I, I of course knew who Curly was. Yeah. But no, no, I wasn't. I, I had never heard anything back in those days. You just were playing. You were just playing. You were just playing it. I was just pulling stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I could never tell you where anything had come from. Well, I think that's cool. Which I think, I, that's... Which I think is good. I think that's a good thing. That's no. Someone asked Count Basie, "Who are your who are your uh, role models or mentors?" He goes, "I, I don't know. I, me, <laughs> I don't have any." <laughs> but I, you know, Jerry, I you know I you know we 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 connected on Facebook. You know, you know what I'm doing. I'm I'm br- bringing out passages about certain things. I wanted you to talk. A lot of people, a lot of musicians have this conception of improvisation. You play a jazz standard. You improvise within the tune. You come back to the head. You finish the tune. Uh, but there is, I would like to know your definition of improvisation because even some of the younger cats I talk to that have some moxie, I mean, they really talk about the idea of improvisation in the sense that you don't know what you're going to play next in, on your instrument. You know, that is true improvisation. And I wanted you just to talk in general about your concept of improvisation in a musical setting. Well, I, I have to agree with that, with what you just said. And, and for me, I, th- I think it's a little different than that. I, I never really studied, uh, you know, theory and improv. And I, I, for me, it's all coming from my ears. And so I think you have to, first of all, be able to open your ears and listen to what's being done around you and play off of that or play into that. And so that, you know, you, you have to be ready to, to allow your heart to get in the way. <laughs> I love it. I think that that's, that's so important. If, if, I, if I'm playing something that isn't moving me somehow, emotionally on some level, like whether it's a rock level, whether it's just a, a, a tonal thing, it, then, it's, then why am I doing it, you know? I, I want. I'm trying to please myself. I guess is what I'm saying. And so, you know, it, being free to do that means being able to listen. That, that's where I'm at with improvisation. Oh, man, Jerry Goodman, cook. Can you talk a little? I mean, you're up in in uh, in the beautiful, lush greens of Eugene, Oregon. I mean, are you still? Burning? I'm in the gray, wet. <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 mossy. <laughs> Uh, it's really coming down. I thought my place was gonna was gonna hit the ground yesterday. The uh, lightning struck right outside, right that, outside. That's a good vibe. I mean, that, that, you know, I was gonna say hey, it didn't yeah. hit, it didn't hit yeah. you, but <laughs> are you? No, I know. My I still have my dog went in the hood somewhere. I haven't seen her yet. Can you? Can you? Are you still? Um, can you talk about any? Are you still actively playing? I am. Can I you am. talk about what capacity? Well, I'm, I'm, right now I'm doing mostly recording stuff, and and because of the way the internet is, I no longer have to live near a recording studio. Right. You know, I, I have one in my house, a small one, small production room, and people send me stuff over the internet and say, "Well, would you mind playing a solo on this or a melody on this?" You know. So I I'm I'm working mostly doing that. You don't have to be in LA anymore to do that. I moved up here after uh, the place I was living in burned down a few years back. And I have a brother who lives up here in Eugene. So I moved here. And I can still get, this, get, the, get the work over the Internet. And I, I do my recording and I do that. But this summer I played a few. Uh, I sat in with a band in, in the Midwest called Bach to the Future. 
<laughs> Bach to the future. <laughs> Bach I, to the future. My, my producer <laughs> loves that line. It's right up your alley, man. Uh, a combination lo- of cl- yeah. classical infusion and mm-hmm. with some wonderful players. And um, the violinist had to take a had to take a trip to Europe for the summer, so I sat in for him, and that was that was great fun. And then I did some playing with uh, with my stepson up in Minneapolis. He's a singer songwriter, school teacher, and I went and played a gig with him, sat in with him in the club, and that was great fun. And uh, so I'm doing that kind of thing. You know, I would like to be doing more playing live, and uh, and I'm trying to set that up. I've had uh, had both my knees replaced, and now I'm able to actually stand for a while and <laughs> walk around. So uh, well, I'd like to pick. I, I'd like to, to pick up. On, yeah, no, I mean, I, I'd like to pick up with you. Uh, you know, we just burned through 40 minutes like nothing here. I got more to talk to you about. I hope we can continue to cook because I'd love to get you. As many times people can see Jerry Goodman on the bandstand, be inspirational, and uh, uh, it'd be great to to do part two with you down the road. Absolutely, man. Whatever yeah, much want. love to you, Jerry. All right, and uh, talk to you soon. The same to you, Jake. Take care. Cheers, brother. Okay. Bye. Yep. That was uh, that's the Jake Feinberg show. Another edition. Mike Roper. Uh, we had uh, Will Blades, bassist, uh, actually B three player too, multi instrumentalist. Uh, um, we had uh, <clears throat> God, I'm butchering it. Glenn Clark, always vexing his name. Country boy from Texas, and then. Uh, Finishing it out with uh, tribal violinist, badass Jerry Goodman. Uh, we kind of went around the world today again. Just eclectic as ever. I mean, a little bit of everything from every music genre. I mean, it's just, it's perfectly, it's perfect. It's perfectly the way you, you yeah. bring it. it. It's just, it yeah. just always, like you said, it comes together just organically. And it's it, like a it gumbo. Just, music is a meal. Yeah. And you got to throw the meal together. Right. It's got to have a lot of tastes. Right and on. So uh, we'll be back next week. Thanks to Mike Roper and, uh, that's it for the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll be back. Take care. Peace. This is quite a while. I've been around the world a few times, but I don't understand. I just like to play the blues. It's not all the money that I want. I just like to play the blues. And I'd like for everybody to get together and all of us play the blues. Let's have a good time. Because blues is why it's at. I'm telling you, I love it. I can't help but play it. So when you wake up in the morning, you're a gig. And ain't got no money, or no gig, whatever you call it. You ain't got nothing but the blues no way, baby. Or either your old lady go do the yak and you're not arguing with you. Yeah. Tell you want you to get up and do something. Yeah. Now go to the studio mill. Yeah. And you know you're going to be seeing that music the blues too. So sometimes you really don't know what to do. And when you get work, all you can do is get a music grab, your harmonica, and try to play the blues a little bit. Dance the blues.